question 19. We closed last week looking at some of the means by which we can know that we've arrived at proper conclusions concerning the scriptures. Uh, that uh, since the Bible is a written document, it has to be read. And if it has to be read, then it of necessity has to be interpreted. And if it has to be interpreted, there has to be a means of interpretation uh, that uh, is consistent uh, that is consistent and uh, uh, does not allow for uh, contradictions with other passages of Scripture. Uh, uh, you know, what we have generally referred to as uh, uh, hermeneutics or our principle of interpretation uh, has generally been viewed as uh, what is known as a, a command, example, and necessary inference. But we noted that there is no specific command given to any person alive today. That everything in the Bible was written to somebody else. So therefore we have to, we have to use inference to find out if what is written applies to us or if it does not apply uh, to us. And then we have to look at these examples. Uh, do the examples of the uh, text, uh, do they in any way uh, impose themselves on us? Or are they just a part of the biblical record? And then the very idea of inference is to gather information, uh, to gather information without being expressly told, and then uh, arriving at a, a reasonable and proper uh, conclusion. And we noted that uh, Jesus and, and the Bible text itself uh, uses all of these uses all of these principles. So therefore, if the Bible uses these principles to interpret itself, for example. To, uh, for, if the Bible uses these principles to interpret passages out of the Old Testament into the New Testament, then we know that those, princ we know that those principles are sound because God used them. And if God used them, then I'm certainly at liberty to, to use them because He's given them to us for a reason. Uh, this, idea, uh, this idea of the Bible as a love letter and not, a, and not any type of written law uh, really leads to the destruction of people's faith. Because if the Bible is nothing more than a love letter, then a person would be at liberty to accept some things and reject others purely based on their feelings about, about how they feel about a certain thing. And so the Bible is, the Bible is not simply a love letter. Uh, it was written to us out of God's love, but it's not to be read in the sense that a love letter from from a, a, a husband to his wife or a wife to husband or a child or father to his child uh, is to be understood. It is a book of instructions. And the Bible says that if we don't listen to the instructions, uh, especially those that pertain to uh, the teaching of Jesus from Deuteronomy 18, Moses foretold it, says that whosoever will not hear the words which he shall speak in my name, I will require to him. Now, that don't sound like a love letter. So it means you got to do it. You got to obey it, and so we want to be clear. We want to be clear that the Bible, and and this all goes to the two weeks that we've studied about the Sabbath. That you know the Bible, the, the Bible teaches us about the Sabbath, but the Bible also teaches us that, uh, and, and Jesus said expressly, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. In other words, God, God didn't make the Sabbath and then make man as, as, a, as a consequence of the Sabbath, but he made man first and he gave the Sabbath second. And by the way, he didn't give the Sabbath for about 2,000 years after he made man, which is another uh, study for another time. All right, now let's, uh, let's go to the questions on the last page of, of uh, Lesson Plan 19. Uh, what does the lesson tell us... <coughs> The, and, you know these questions come out of the generally come out of the text of the of the material uh, that that is written or, or provided. Uh, describe the hostility of the Jewish leaders toward Jesus. Was it was how does the how does the lesson describe that hostility? They were very hostile, and it was rapidly growing. In other words, there, were, there was hostility in regard to Jesus, but that hostility was just, uh, and really from the earliest days, it's like it was on steroids. It just got worse and worse and worse, exponentially worse all, all the time. And it was like, it's like, uh, 
It's almost like, you know, if a person's already mad, it don't take a whole lot to make them really mad. And even the thing, even that thing that might make a person really mad is not, is not sufficient for the response. You know? That's it. And that's what I was getting at, is that, is that just, just the small, you know, once they were mad, any and everything was just exponentially magnified and intensified toward Jesus. And so every, every move he made, everything that he said, over, you know, just from beginning to end, they were just looking for any little thing. So, you know, we, once you, well, you know, if Rhonda was in here, or Stephanie or Shannon, somebody, you know, uh, you know school teachers. You know, a school teacher can talk. Oh, there's some. There's Sam back there in the back, looking on the wrong side. Yeah. In in your in your classroom, in your classroom, there's a lot of things you can tolerate in and of themselves. But then once you once you cross the threshold of of toleration into aggravation, then those little things are magnified because we're already we're already in a state of discomfort. And, uh, and so that was the situation with the Pharisees and, and the Jewish leaders of the day. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, those things uh, uh, in just a moment. And then also, I think it's... Fa- Ma'am. Well... Right. Yeah, there were, well, there were a number of reasons. And it would depend on where he was and what he was doing. You know, one was, he, and, and the lesson says he didn't want to. He didn't want to incense. I, and I think that's lesson twenty. I think it's, I think that's the lesson for today. Uh, but but it's still the same principle. But sometimes sometimes he told people not to tell because it was going to hinder his work. In other words, there were, there were things he needed to get accomplished, and, and a huge crowd a huge crowd of people was not going to be conducive for him to get done what he needed to get done, which, you know, his primary purpose was to preach the gospel of the kingdom to all the Jewish people. You know, and when people wanted him to, when people wanted him to, to, to stay a while, he would say, look, I can't, I can't stay. I got to, you know, I got to go preach other places. He says, for this is the purpose to which I was sent. And so, and so, it, you know, to heal a man, and then that man go into the city and drag five, six, seven, eight hundred people out of the city, then all of a sudden now Jesus is going to have to deal with them. And by the way, in all these accounts, Jesus did deal with them. We're going to talk about this in, in Lesson 20, about what Jesus did when the multitudes came. And so there were a lot, there were a lot of reasons why Jesus would not want someone to, to speak of what uh, he had done. And that's one of them because of the animosity that had already been uh, created, but then also because there was a job to be done, and, 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 and for lack of a better way of describing it, a, a multitude of people was a, dis- a distraction, was a distraction because that multitude of people weren't there necessarily to hear what he had to say. They were there to get healed, which, look, that's a good reason to want to go see Jesus. I'm not saying it's not, but... but you know, Jesus couldn't get done what he needed to get done if every single sick person in every single city sought him out every single day. I mean, it's kind of like Moses judging the people. You know, he sat up there and he judged the people from daylight to dark. You know, and, he, and he wasn't able to do anything else other than, than serve as, a, as an arbiter and, and a mediator among the people. And that wasn't what God needed him to be doing. And he used his father-in-law, uh, Jethro, to give him some really good advice that, that was not only good for him, but it was also good for the people uh, as well. All right, uh, question two, is, and we've talked about this. What is the meaning of the word Sabbath? Rest. rest. It means rest. And overwhelmingly, when we see the word Sabbath, what day, what day should we think? Saturday. But it doesn't always mean Saturday because some, some holidays, holy days, fell on certain days of the month and not on certain days of the week, and they were also called Sabbaths. And that, no, as, uh, the phrase to be found repeatedly, no customary work was to be done. No customary work was to be done. But the word Sabbath uh, means rest. 
All right, now, how did the observance of the Sabbath turn into a complicated and burdensome chore? Yeah, the, the, all right, the, because the added man-made laws and the interpretation of what the laws they had. Of, of the laws that they, yeah of the laws that they made. We talked about this in terms. We talked about it in terms of hedges. In other words, they built hedges around the law. And if you don't cross the hedge, then you're certainly not going to be in violation of the law. But then the hedges had hedges, and those hedges had hedges, and. And pretty soon it just looked like a maze of hedges. And then the attitude was, if you violated the hedges, you violated the law. And, and, and their traditions became more, became more important than the law. That's right. The, the, the traditions actually began to exceed, uh, exceed the law. Um, um, I, I wrote down here, um, uh, Matthew 15. In Matthew 15, verses 1 through 9, Jesus spe is speaking to uh, his, Jewish, his Jewish opponents. And uh, verse 2, it says, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. Now, they readily admitted that there wasn't anything in the law. But by the way they phrased the question, they admitted this is not a violation of the law. It's a violation of the tradition of the elders. There's nothing in the Bible about eating, about how, how you had to wash your hands uh, before you eat. And then Jesus answers by saying, Why do you transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? Now here, here's something we have to understand that also sheds light on another commandment of God. And that is this. Verse 4 says, For God commanded you to honor your father and mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. In other words, that's what God said. God said, honor your father and mother, and it says, if you curse father or mother, you're to be put to death. But you say, you know, God commanded, but you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift of God, then he need not honor his father and mother, and you've made the commandment of God of no effect by your traditions. Now I want you to note some things here, what this, what this text teaches us. Uh, is Number one, the idea of honoring father and mother is not what we've probably all been taught from childhood. You know, we've always been, you know, we were always taught as kids, honor your father and mother means means that when you're, when you're living under the household of your mama and daddy, you do what they say. And by the way, that's right. <laughs> I mean, we're supposed to do that, but that's not what this text teaches. This is not what it says. This is not what the Ten Commandments were teaching. And Jesus illustrates this. No, because he says the Jews had made God's command of no effect. How? Don't answer by their tradition. How? Well, here's a, here's a man who has the means to take care of his father and mother when they are in need. That's what's going on here. Here's a man who has the financial means to take care of his mom and daddy when they are in need. But he says to them, I'm not going to help you because all the money that I might save from helping you is dedicated to God. And it says, therefore, you don't, have to, you don't have to honor your father and mother if you decide to take the money that you've saved and give it to God. So what does honoring your father and mother really mean in the Ten Commandments? What does it really mean? When it, it tells us that honoring your father and mother means you take care of them when they're in need. That's what that, and, and by the way, that's the promise that atta is attached to it. That it may be well with you and that you might live long on the earth. Now, how does that work? Well, it works out kind of like in the case that, that, that I've been able to live. You know, I watched my mom take care of her dad you know, while he died of cancer. And then right after he died in 96, my grandma's cancer came back, and my mom took care of her mom for another eight or nine years. 
when she had cancer. And she took care of her, and she died at home under hospice care. Right? So, now, me being witness to these things, I mean, they sold their house and moved in with my grandparents. Sold the house. I mean, it wasn't that... This is right down the road, about, about as far as from here to where I live now. All right? They sold that house and moved in. So now, you know, what did I witness? What did I witness in my mother with regard to her parents? Took care of them when they had need, right? She honored her father and her mother. Now, what do you think is going to happen if my mom ends up in that shape? Yeah, but that's what people say, but what's going to happen in my mom's case? I'm going to take care of her because I've, already, I've been witness to it. I saw what she did with her parents, and that's why the promise is attached to that commandment, that it might be well with you that you might live long on the earth. In other words, you see your parents take care of their parents, then you take care of your parents, and then your children are going to see you take care of your parents, and then they're going to learn to take care of you when you need it. Because in those days, there was no nursing home. You know, there wasn't no hospice care. There wasn't, no, by the way, and I'm not saying everybody that's in a nursing home doesn't belong there because I go to the nursing home three or four days a week, and I'm telling you, there's a lot of people that have to be there. A lot of people that have to be there, right? But not everybody has to be there. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. And it may be the case that when you have to put your, your parent in a place like that, you are honoring them because they get beyond your, abil your ability to care for them. But the point is, the point is, when you do for your parents, your children will see the same because in those days there wasn't anybody, there was no, you know, wasn't no Medicare, wasn't no Medicaid, you know, wasn't no fallback plan, no f old folks home, you know, no place for the indigent. No government handouts. And so you were actually, in taking care of your own parents, providing yourself an insurance for when you got old. And so that's what Jesus is talking about. And he says, and you've, you've negated the commandment of God. By the way, just because the, man, hey, just because the man told his parents he didn't have to take care of them because he's going to give it to God, doesn't mean that he still couldn't spend it the way he wanted to in the meantime. See how that works? You know, it's going to cost me, you know, it's going to cost me $20,000 a year to take care of my parents. And so, and, and I figured they might make it another five years, so that's $100,000. And so I'm going to commit all the money I save that I don't spend on my parents. And then when I die, it's all going to God. Well, guess what? I might go out and buy me a new truck with that first twenty grand that I've saved. I might go buy me something else for that next 20000 that I've saved. And basically I've spent it on myself instead of spending it on my parents, but I've done it under the guise of making the gift to God. And so uh, the, 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 uh, the, the observance of the Sabbath was a, was a nightmare because when man decides he wants to improve on what God has given him, it always ends up bad. It always ends up, always ends up bad. All right. Um, question four is kind of, kind of cryptic a little bit, but it is in, it is in the text. Um, what were some examples, or what were some of Jesus' examples of how he and his father were united? Father, Sir? All right, or whatever he's told to do by his father, he did. They were. E he said they were equal. He said he made the statement that they were equal, but to say a thing and prove a thing are two different things, right? There you go, John. Yeah, the five witnesses of John five. John, you know, John gave testimony of it. I've testified of it. He said, God has testified, my father's testified of it. 
The miracles that I do testify of it, and the giving of authority testifies to it. In other words, God gave Jesus the authority to do everything that God himself could do. He gave me the authority to do all the things that God himself could do. And so it wasn't, it wasn't just simply a delegated, a delegated authority uh, in some things. It was equal authority in all things. Jesus had the authority to forgive sin. That's ultimately a divine prerogative. Nobody else can forgive sins but God alone. And so Jesus, and, and, and when, he healed, you know, when he healed that lame man in Mark 2, he showed that he had the authority to forgive sins. At, yeah, at the baptism? Oh, now you're talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. Yeah. When God called him his son, he made him his equal. By the way, Zechariah 13, 7 uh, is a prophecy about Jesus. And he calls him a man who is my companion or fellow. He's my companion or fellow. And implied in that statement, Zechariah 13, 7, that he's my equal. He's my equal. You know, when we have a fellowship dinner, what are we declaring? We're declaring that we're all equal. Isn't that right? In other words, what, I, what is mine... I share with you, and what is yours, you, you are sharing with me. And if you don't have anything to share, you still come, and you can still pile your plate a mile high. Right? We're equals. That's what fellowship is all about. All right? When God said he's my fellow, when God was prophesying through Zechariah that, that the, the Christ would be his companion and his fellow, he's, mean, he's equal with me. He's equal with me. And so the Bible's you know, filled with uh, Old Testament and New Testament uh, imagery. Oh, that's John 1. First John 1. Yeah, yeah, that's first John one. That's exactly right. Those fellowships, y'all are y'all equal with me because of Christ's son. Yeah, he declared the equality. All right, uh, question five. Were the priests guilty when they worked on the Sabbath? No. They were not guilty. They were not guilty. And when when the Bible would say, when the Bible says they profaned the Sabbath. We've got to get our English understanding of that word profane out of our heads. Because we think about profane, we think about profane language, profane actions, things that are vile or wicked. When the Bible uses the term profane, it means nothing more than to make common. Make common. In other words, when it says, you profane my Sabbath, it means you take my Sabbath day and you treat it just like it was a common day any other day. All right? And so when the Bible speaks about profaning a thing, it just simply means to take something that should be set apart and turning it into something that's not set apart at all. Now, that's eventually how, that's eventually how, the word profanity came into use because people didn't use that kind of language except, you know, the, lo no, it's the lowest of the people. The lowest of the people used that kind of language. And that, that's why it was called profane. And then it became to be profanity. And now it just means profanity and everybody gets to use it. You know, from you know, from you know, from the from the from the lowest guy to the president of the United States, and it has not and it has nothing to do with with a person's status. It's just it's just changed meaning. That's why we got to get that you know. That's why we got to get that out of our get that thinking out of our heads. Uh, question six: How did the Pharisees view the Herodians? They despised the Herodians. They hated them. But now I'm going to ask you, why? Because that's not in the lesson. That's not fair, is it? Ask questions not in the lesson like that. 
Herodians are only mentioned two times in the whole, in the whole Bible, in the New Testament. One at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, the other at the end of his ministry, and both times in cahoots with the Pharisees. And, that, and that's the only time the Bible speaks about the Herodians. What we do know about the Herodians is, unlike the Sadducees and unlike the Pharisees, which were religious groups, the Herodians were a political group. They were tied to the Herods. And and the and the uh, uh, the they were and their, uh, the Herods were Idumeans. By the way, you know why why did the Pharisees hate the Herodians? What do you know about Herod, or what do you know about the Herodians? What do you know about the Idumeans? For example, who who was the king? Who was the king over Israel? Herod. All right, but who does the Bible? All right, now. Who did the Bible declare was supposed to be the king over Israel? I mean, I mean in a physical way. The lineage of who? There's two answers. Both of them correct. One had to be out of the tribe of Judah. Two had to be out of the household of David. Had to be out of the tribe of Judah, Genesis 49. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. Had to be of the lineage of David. They, you know, David and Solomon you know, and, and Rehoboam and all the, kings, uh, all the kings of Judah were out, up until a pretty good ways down were all out of the household of David. The Herods didn't have any connection to David. <laughs> and not only that, they didn't have any connection to Judah. And on top of that, they didn't have any connection to Israel. They were a bunch of outsiders who ingratiated themselves to the Roman government who set them up as the kings over Israel. And so Herod wasn't even a Jew. Well, yeah, they, yeah, they destroyed the priesthood, and they destroyed the high priesthood in particular. But the, but the Pharisees hated the Herodians because the Herodians were holding up were holding up a political class that had no right that had no right to, to exert any authority over the Jewish people. So so the the, the Pharisees were 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 intense nationalists, and the Herodians. The Herodians were in the pocket of Rome. And that's the only reason they were there. And everybody knew that was the only reason they were there. And the Pharisees and everybody in, in, in Judea knew that when the chips were down, the Herodians were going to side with the Romans because that's where their bread was buttered. And so I'm trying to illustrate how, how intense this hatred is of these two groups. But when one man threatens the interests of two warring factions, what do those two warring factions always manage to do? They'll come together. Yep. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. The Pharisees were the enemy of Jesus. The Herodians were the enemy of Jesus. And thus they came together at various times in order to destroy Jesus Four different purposes. In other words, the Pharisees were trying. The Pharisees were trying to protect their religious sway that they held over the people. By the way, even the apostles, deep into the ministry of Jesus, were still scared of the Pharisees. That's something we have to remember. In Matthew 15, when Jesus said, "It's not what." goes into a man's mouth that defiles him, but what comes out? You remember what the apostles said to Jesus? Don't you know that the Pharisees were offended by that? Now, if they didn't care what the Pharisees thought, why would they say that? See, even the apostles still felt, still felt themselves under the thumb of the Pharisees. And Jesus was trying to release them from that. Leave them alone. They're blind leaders of the blind. 
If the blind lead the blind, they all fall in the ditch. Jesus is trying to release them from out from being under the thumb of the Pharisees. You know, oh, you know, the Pharisees were just man, they just they just weighed heavily on the people all the time. They lived their lives in constant fear of the Pharisees and what the Pharisees thought. And so Jesus was a threat to that. So the Pharisees had to get rid of Jesus on that account. The Herodians had to get rid of Jesus, going all the way back to Matthew chapter 2, when the wise men showed up in Jerusalem and said, Where is he that is born? What? King of the Jews. Now, Jesus is perceived by the Pharisees as a religious threat, and he was. He was perceived by the Herodians as a political threat, which he wasn't. He wasn't. But Christianity is not a political threat to anyone who wants to do right. And when I do when I say do right, I don't mean I don't mean like read the Bible to the people over the radio waves every day and do right. I just mean do right in general. I mean you can have a you can have a, a, a representative republic like we have, or you can even have a dictatorship. You know, Christianity is not a threat to those things because Christianity is not interested in those things. But they're perceived to be an enemy. Look, Christianity is, I, I truly believe this. I don't think Christianity is a threat to, to communism. And I know so, and when I mean, I mean commun, communism in its purest form, which I think is a terrible, a terrible form of government. I think it's born, I think about 100 million people dead is born out that that's not a very good way to run your people, all right? But Christianity is not a threat to that because Christianity is not interested in politics. You know, the, the practice of the Christian religion ought to be able to be performed under any system of government, right? Because what do Christians want? What do Christians want for you know what what are Christians supposed to do for their government? Obey it, honor it, pray for it. What are Christians supposed to do for their fellow man? What? Same thing, but but also provide help. Help, you know. You know, we're not just supposed to help one another as Christians. We're supposed to help, you know, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. And so the Herodians perceived that the Herodians perceived that Jesus was a threat to their political system. And I don't think that's correct, but nevertheless, it brought those two sides together and they joined forces in, in an attempt to destroy, uh, to destroy Jesus. All right, question seven. Did Jesus ever break the Sabbath law? Did he ever break the Sabbath law? That's yeah, not breaking the law, though. The question is, is it, did Jesus ever break the Sabbath law? He couldn't have, because if he had broke the Sabbath law, it would have made him a what? A sinner. <laughs> and so Jesus never sinned. And the point Jesus is making, and the point of, the point of this, the point of this uh, 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 statement is, is that, again, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And he's the Lord of the Sabbath. And he's the Lord of the Sabbath. In other words, he gave it. <laughs> he gave it. But the point, again, the point he's making is, the, the, the Sabbath law is pretty general. And anybody that loves the Lord can, can follow it without a whole bunch of hedges involved. You know, if your ox falls in a ditch, go get him. <laughs> You know, if you, you know, if your animals need water, go water them. You know, that, you know, those are necess those are necessities of life. You know, but again, anybody with common sense and a love for the Lord can can observe, you know, can observe the Sabbath day. You know, without being accused of being a violator. I'll give you an example. I don't know. I, I think the speed limit from Mark Deering's office to the hospital is forty-five mile an hour. I might. I think it's forty-five miles an hour. All right. If I'm toting my wife to the emergency room and I got my flashers on and I'm doing 60 miles an hour, am I going to get in trouble for that? Oh, 
If, I, you know, if a policeman pulled me over, he ain't going to get me pulled over until I pull in the emergency room exit. And then he's going to realize what? I got an emergency. Yeah. Under normal circumstances, I need to drive 45. Under these circumstances, I can drive 60. I'll give you another one. This is a real life example. I can't tell you how many times I came off of Mitchell Hill there uh, at the courthouse at the stoplight at 2 a.m. in the morning and that light thing skipped me twice. Ain't nobody on the road at 2 a.m. in the morning. And for some reason, if you're going east on 278, half the time you can't get the light to turn green. Me and Neil, me and Neil Selman used to talk about this all the time. You know what I'm going to do the second time? The second time that thing runs, runs around and don't give me a green light? I'm running that bad boy. I'm running it. All right. Now, if a policeman just so happened to see that me that I ran a red light at 2 a.m., he's probably going to pull me over, right? And for good reason. There's a lot of reasons he might pull me over. But when he pulls me over down there at the bottom of the hill, and I said, look, man, I've been sitting there for five minutes, and that light rotated three times. I never did get a green light. I figured it's good to go. And he figures out I'm not drinking or I'm not up to, you know, I'm not up to no meanness. You know what he's going you know to do? He's going to send me on to the house. You know, the red light was made for the man and not the man for the red light. <laughs> that's, what Jesus, that's what Jesus is teaching here with, with the matter, uh, with the matter of, of the Sabbath. In other words, use some sense. Use some sense. All right? Quite, last question is, did Jesus ever violate any of the man-made traditions? Oh, yeah. <laughs> violate a lot of them. Which means you can violate man-made traditions and not do what? Sin. That's exactly right. Well, I thought we was going to get to lesson 20, but I was wrong.